So we're now moving on. Uh, we promised you four different viewpoints. We're in the middle. So we've done with industry and we've talked about society. We're moving on to sustainability, a word that probably everyone values and thinks about, but what does it really mean? So on the question of how can sustainability ensure growth and security of the electricity grid, we present to you Antonella Battaglini. She is the CEO of the Renewables Grid Initiative. She is currently a member of the European Commission's expert group on electricity interconnection targets and has previously been an expert member of the World Economic Forum 2014 to 2016 Global Agenda Council on the Future of Electricity. She uh, is also a senior scientist at the Boston University Institute of Climate Impact Research, where she leads the super smart grid process a concept she developed with, together with her team to reconcile different approaches to the system integration of renewables. She will discuss the question of sustainability and on the topic of exploring the sustainable opportunities in the energy shift. Good morning and thank you very much for uh, having me. I'm going to share my screen and then start. How do I do this? This is obviously the key problem. Okay, sorry, sorry. Here we are. Very good. Um, so I would like to start by telling you who is talking, uh, what is RGI, the organization I'm leading, and why we talk about sustainability. Um, RGI is uh, the short name of the Renewables Grid Initiative, is a unique collaboration between industry and civil society. Uh, we set up RGI, or it was my idea, over 10 years ago, 11 years ago exactly, because um, it was clear that the challenges of building uh, the needed electricity grid are not going to be easily uh, addressed unless we do it across um, sectors. So these former enemies of transmission system operators and environmental NGOs decided and understood that actually they do have something in common. And under the umbrella of RGI, they started to work together. Um, so this is uh, uh, our geographical coverage, <laughs> European for us is still a, quite a limited concept, unfortunately, and we will be looking at expanding more closely uh, towards the Central and Eastern European countries. Um, we consider that the electricity grids are the enablers of the energy transition. Now, don't take me wrong. Um, there is not only one enabler, there are many. But very often, uh, with, we have been talking for decades uh, on the need to increase renewable energy sources, solar and wind, um, to develop storage more recently, and so on. But we have systematically, for over a decade, uh, missed the um, to add that renewables without grids are not really um, possible. Um, so our work on grids um, is important to enable the energy transition. However, grids are not nice. Look at this. Um, I always tend to say the grids are not beautiful. So we need to do something not only to make them more sustainable, but also more acceptable. Um, the energy transition is uh, what I call a multi multidimensional process. Um, those who think that it's a technological or a political process probably are completely wrong because it is first and most of all a societal. Uh, process. Uh, and it is uh, um, complicated and complex because we need to tackle these multi dimensions 
all in parallel. Moreover, the energy transition takes place not in isolation or in an abstract environment, but in our social and natural environment. So the conflicts are very severe and the emotion can be very high. What you see in this um, uh, slide is uh, the natural environment, of course, on land and offshore. Um, and the image that you see on the left, on the bottom left, uh, come from Norway, where uh, they depicted uh, electricity pylons as monsters. Um, this is not unique. Uh, this is actually very common. And still, we need to overcome the conflict to be sure that we deliver the um, infrastructure that is needed for this energy transition. So how do we do it? What are the conditions to address these urgent challenges that we are faced with? Let me remember what are the challenges. Uh, the energy transition does not come in isolation. It comes because, of course, we have energy security concerns and we have the urgency of fighting climate change. But this is not the only challenge that we are facing. We have a biodiversity challenge. We have an incredible deterioration of uh, nature with huge consequences for the livelihood of humans on planet Earth. Um, and of course, we have societal challenges um, with increasing um, extreme positions increasing poverty, increasing uh, migration of people, and increasing uh, divisions between classes and between races. So how do we deal with this? We cannot just deal with that with one silver bullet. All of those that come and propose A or B to solve the problem, Today, in the context of the energy transition, we can say, oh, smart grid will do everything. Or uh, hydrogen will solve all problems. Or uh, nuclear has always been there for the past 50 years and we can deliver. So whatever you say, it is actually wrong. Because to deal with the multiple challenges that we are facing, we need multiple solutions. And the solutions have to be sustainable. Sustainability is not what very often in the energy discussion uh, is considered. Um, if you look at the um, energy policy, um, third energy package and other uh, documents, including the cost-benefit analysis that is applied for the selection of project of common European interest, sustainability is defined in a very narrow way. Uh, it is defined as emissions. Of course, for climate, emissions are important, but sustainability is more than emission. It's a very broad concept that includes people and nature and also the economy. Uh, to look to find solutions that are really sustainable today and for the generations to come. We need to build collaboration that are cross borders and cross sectors. Only in this way, we can develop solution, we can test the solution, and then we can scale these solutions in a way that are acceptable by the majority of stakeholders and not just a few. Um, another reason, another way or, or another important step um, to address the challenges that we are facing, it is uh, to understand the world we are in. Very often we take decisions based on yesterday on the experience that we have done in the past 500 years. Uh, history indeed is a, a very good source 
of knowledge. Um, but it, it is sometimes misused to avoid uh, progress. Um, understanding the world we are in, it is essential to embrace the future. Um, the decisions that we are going to need have to be based not on yesterday's knowledge, but they have to be based on the possibilities that we have for tomorrow. The IEA um, this year in October launched the Energy Outlook. And for the first time, also the IEA, a rather conservative organization, uh, showed that electricity is the cheapest uh, form, um, that solar PV is the cheapest uh, source of electricity. Despite this, today, there are so many barriers that prevent um, massive scale up of um, renewable energy sources. Of course, PV and wind are both the cheapest uh, electricity sources today. Um, and because of this, we have delayed, delay in the deployment. And we invest in technologies that are not good for the environment and too costly for society. Um, of course, we need to base our decisions on actual data and learn from the mistakes. What you see here is a decadal trend of stock value for key players in the energy sector. And you see that uh, uh, big electricity companies like uh, Iberdrola, Osted, and so on, have been steadily increasing their stock value, while big oil company, very big oil company, have systematically decreased. Still, around the world, we keep betting on oil and fossil to save some of these companies from going bankrupt. This is obviously not sustainable. I recognize that uh, it is also not sustainable to scrap certain actors from one day to the other, but we need the political process and a societal process to help actors to transform themselves and become fitted for the future. Some experience of this um, that I would like to share with you is what we are doing in our GI to support uh, um, activities that are respectful of people and nature for the energy transition. What you see here on this slide is the logos of the founding members of the offshore coalition for energy and nature that we launched uh, last Monday, this week, Monday, so three days ago, actually. <laughs> and um, um, again, we bring together very diverse interest groups to find the solution that are needed. Offshore, as you need, know, is expected to grow exponentially. It is one of the key pillars of decarbonization in Europe. The Commission is uh, today launching the offshore strategy. Um, however, like on land, energy infrastructure um, is causing a lot of impacts. Moreover, in the marine environment, there is a very strong competition of users. Uh, economic activities have already degraded uh, our seas and oceans at a level that is extremely dangerous. So how do we set up processes that find solutions that prevent delays in deploying infrastructure, both generation and grid infrastructure, while at the same time protecting and enhancing nature? Um, in the past, it was only one actor 
maybe the project developer coming up with idea. And now what we want to see is that this cross sectors collaboration, because uh, uh, not only we need new solution, we need the legitimacy of the process that lead to these new solutions and the scrutiny that the solutions are really effective and not just greenwashing. Um, some more examples. What you see here is um, a, um, Posidonia Oceanica. When you build grids um, underwater, especially in the Mediterranean area, you may have to pass through um, seagrass, Ocea Posidonia Oceanica. It's a very dangerous, it's a very delicate ecosystem. Um, Posidonia Oceanica is a species that is very, is growing very slowly and it is very delicate to any uh, human activities and to pollution. And here you see how new uh, approaches are being developed to transplant the very delicate plants uh, that have be, had to be cut when um, laying the cables and to uh, grow a Posidonia oceanica um, forest, like Red Electrica tends to call it. Here, another example of how can you build grids, um, thinking about uh, uh, the dangers that grids can um, have. Um, electricity grids are uh, dangerous for birds because of electrocution in case of large birds and collisions. Uh, there have been a number of um, um, devices that have been deployed, but also other um, initiatives like building nests, um, because birds actually do like grains if they don't get killed on them. And so um, this is also part of a collaborative project between grid operators and um, the bird life network. Uh, another example is um, um, green corridors. Um, when you build grids, you cover thousands of kilometers of um, different uh, landscapes and different ecosystems. So if you connect all these uh, uh, corridors and you use the corridors as a service for nature, you can indeed restore ecosystems and support also the, um, the protection of species that are uh, under threat. Um, in order to foster this uh, multidisciplinarity and uh, um, the, um, we have also looked at uh, uh, the European planning, there is a very strong ongoing discussion of what are the scenarios that we should use to plan for energy infrastructure. Um, and at the moment, uh, the scenarios that are used are not fully, or oh, all of them are not compliant with the Paris Agreement. They are not meeting the 1.5 degree targets. And so we have come up with a very large number of signatories, 51. I don't have a, a slide showing all the logos um, to uh, adapt uh, the grid planning process, but also we engage in developing more sophisticated and more uh, holistic approaches to the energy transition. Uh, we do it also by uh, participating in research projects like uh, the Horizon 2020 Sentinel and why. And now let me come to the point on how do we prepare for the future. Um, I would like to stress the fact that uh, education is essential. Um, and education has to be designed not to put students into a box, 
but rather to foster and reward critical thinking. We have spent decades in building uh, experts, specialists, but by doing this, we did not realize that we were creating silos. And in a silos, the view may be beautiful, like in, in the picture I put there of the sky, but it's very limited. So I believe that uh, universities, but also uh, at a lower educational level, we need to understand that the, for the future, we need multidisciplinarity expert. We need to bridge between a generalist and a specialist. At the end of the day, we need individuals that are specialists in many different disciplines. And this will require completely new um, curriculum. Moreover, to prepare for the future, we need flexibility and innovation. Flexibility is one of the most important characteristics of the energy system today, but it has to be also one of the most important characteristics of our thinking. Whoever says it's not possible, it's probably wrong. Does be, things being difficult does not imply that they are not possible. But of course, we need to apply the non-harm principle and the precautionary principle. Because while we can be very good at innovating, we don't want to deploy technologies that may prevent humans to actually continue to be uh, yeah, living on planet Earth. And so with this, I conclude my presentation and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you uh, for your contribution to this uh, conference and your presentation. So we have a few questions that um, I can present to you. So um, from the grid point of view, uh, if we reduce the amount of fossil or unsustainable fuels and increase the proportion of renewables with variable generation, what would be the what would what would be well, sorry using to balance voltage, frequency, and balance in general? So you are, you are asking, um, okay, sorry. Yes, I'm here. Um, so you are asking how do we balance the grid if we have a lot of uh, variable renewable energy sources, correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I said we need flexibility and flexibility comes in many different forms. Um, balancing the grid is fundamental because otherwise we risk blackout. Um, today, the TSOs have already developed new approaches to flexibility. In fact, we have countries where we have had up to 100% or even more than 100% renewables in the system for multiple hours and multiple weeks. Um, depending on your location, flexibility and your needs, flexibility, uh, the flexibility needs differ. If you are an island, of course, you will need much more uh, connectivity to neighboring countries. You will need storage devices. You will need demand side management is you need everywhere anyway, demand response. And of course, um, you need flexible reactive power. Traditionally, uh, this was provided by fossil fuels, but more and more there are options for renewables to also provide reactive power. Um, so flexibility is a multitude of options in the energy sector. And we all need, we need all of them, but we need them at different phases and we need them in different points in time, during a day or during a season or during the next decade. 
And the task that is needed, and probably that would be very useful from academ for academia to also engage in this, is to spell out what do we need when. And this is, of course, a learning process. TSOs are um, investing huge amount of resources, mental resources, technological resources, to address uh, system adequacy and how to find uh, ways to keep the um, system always in balance. But of course, today we do not know exactly how are we going to manage a system of even 100% renewables? And I would argue we don't need to know it today. Today we need to know how do we make the next step and the next step and what are the tools that we ha need today and what are the needs for which we need to develop tools tomorrow. And of course, part of the flexibility tools is also markets. You may uh, know that during the solar eclipse, it may have been costly, but markets have been so successful in uh, preventing any shortage and preventing any blackout. So most of the tools we have work, we need to use them better. Thank you. Um, although this is fascinating and we would definitely like to uh, continue the conversation, we must uh, move on. Uh, so thank you again.